Mother of Trans, When Ideology Meets Reality, please welcome to the podium, Miss Helen Wilson. Thank you very much. So I'm here kind of like uh, Christi Christina to give you a message from abroad and kind of a message from the future because some other countries have gone a bit further down the path than Ireland has. All, for all that Ireland has gender self-ID, as we all know this is quite a small C conservative country, so even when new laws are brought in it takes us some time to use them to their full idiocy. <laughs> so I'm specifically going to talk about schools because either Either you fix this in schools or you don't. And if you fix it in schools, you're pretty much there to fixing it, because schools are where the new little ideologues get created. Or you don't fix it in schools, in which case I think you can't fix it anywhere else, whatever the law says. Yeah. So we've been promoting gender ideology in British schools for close to 10 years now. And the result is that the social contagion has gone beyond the early adopters. That's what we've seen this year. It's gone beyond the kids who have pre-existing reasons why they might be dissociated from their bodies or feel Ill, Ill at ease with their sex. And now it's really uh, among a lot of ordinary kids with no pre-existing problems. So I said social contagion. Um, both gender theory and gender distress are a social contagion. That doesn't mean that they aren't real. It means that they're partly created and partly shaped by the culture that we live in. So people always say to me, but you know, there are some real trans people. How many people do you think that are really trans? And the other ones, you know, they're pretending or they've you know, caught it or they're confused or something like that. But I don't think there really is an answer to that question because I don't think there's a thing that we can properly call, usefully call trans. You know, what's the, it's an umbrella term. It's an umbrella term for a whole bunch of different things that are linked only by an idea and that idea is that there's a sensible way to use what we've always thought of as sexed terms, man, woman, male, female, boy, girl, that doesn't just simply refer to our evolved mammalian biology, but refers to an identity. And that idea is a contagious idea, it's a meme, it spreads. And that those groups have nothing in common with each other, a middle-aged man who's been cross-dressing since he was a teenager, uh, an autistic teenage girl who is perhaps an incipient lesbian, uh, you know, a very, very uh, feminine little boy. Um, you know, these, these groups do not have anything in common except that this idea is unusually appealing to them. So being trans, as I say in my book, is basically a, a culturally specific interpretation of certain thoughts and feelings. And in no other time have we ever seen it given serious consideration that those thoughts and fe feelings meant that you were in some sense really a member of the opposite sex. That's a thought that did occur to people every now and then but not very often, and it doesn't mean anything to anybody else. But it turns out that when social media and when schools and when human rights law are all pushing that idea, it's a highly contagious idea. It's one of the most successful memes we've ever seen. Now, it's a particularly useful one uh, when everybody is sitting around in front of their computers, and a very good one when you've got social media to spread the idea, and a very good one when we're all living as avatars, when we're not out in nature, when child rearing is much later, when people have much smaller families, for all these reasons, but also another one that it's managed to hook on to all the wrong metaphors. So it's presented, the idea that a man can be a woman is presented as a civil rights battle, the latest in a long line of civil rights battles over, over centuries. It's got that feeling of inevitability, the sort of the long arc of history bends slowly, but it bends towards freedom or whatever that quote is. Um, I can't remember it because I just am so sick of it being misused. But it's much better to think of it as something like an eating disorder than something like a civil rights battle. It's a created disease that uh, ends up overtaking a person's thought process. And we know that these sorts of ideas can be created, they can be moulded, we know they're contagious. In other words, they can be taught. And we learn all the time in, sc but in schools, that's where we're there specifically to learn. So when this idea is taught in school, it's really effective. And it's my contention that over the past 10 years in the UK, anti-bullying, anti-prejudice, equality and human rights frameworks, and above all, a relationships and sex education have been hijacked to teach this idea that a man can be a woman and that it's bigoted to ever mention somebody's sex if they don't want you to. 
So in the UK, um, RSE and PSHE, that's Relationships and Sex Education, and Personal, Social and Health Education are compulsory, but they've only been compulsory since about 2018, 2017, 2018. And there's no curriculum, there's just some guidelines. But that just opened the door to a lot of lobby groups um, like Stonewall, Mermaids, Gendered Intelligence, smaller groups called things like Pop and Ollie. Uh, and they produced materials which they either um, put out free online that schools can use or they, um, they work with schools and they get a contract to provide them with a curriculum. And that uh, curriculum can even start at age four. So some of the things that I've seen are really intended for early years, for the first few years in school. And a thing happens to children between the ages of three and seven that's called, it's called gender constancy, but it would be better understood as sex constancy. It's the bit where the, what, the child realises that what makes you a boy or a girl isn't your hair and your clothes, it's your body. So if you ask a two or three year old, if you have a little boy, you'll you know, give him a dress and grow his hair long and call him Louise, that child will probably think that child turns into a girl, but by seven they don't think that anymore. So between three and seven there are now children in England who are being told that does make the child a girl, that is what a child is. And they will really expressly say that doctors guessed what you were when you were born. And they guessed whether you were a boy or a girl, but you have to wait until the baby is old enough to tell you whether you were a boy or a girl, or something else. And then there's this sort of suggest selling of the whole thing, that it's more exciting, like it'd be boring to be a boring cis person, like that's very basic, but like it'd be much more fun to, to identify as something else and maybe to identify as non-binary or gender fluid or some people are so special that they don't even identify their gender as on the spectrum, it's something else. <laughs> and this is being told to six and seven year olds. So I think that the aim is really to interrupt the process of developing sex con constancy. But even if you don't manage that, when you hit teenagers, it's actually surprisingly easy to persuade, especially children, uh, sorry, girls, to, 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 to tell girls in particularly that your sex doesn't really matter, that it's not something that's important. Because I think girls are quite ashamed of their sex a lot of the time. Like you get wolf whistled, you grow your breasts too young, you know, periods are shameful, they have to be concealed. Women are physically weaker, women can be raped. You know, you feel, you feel like you're the sort of, well, the second sex, really, in, in the words of Simone de Beauvoir. So it's quite tempting to believe somebody who says that sex is really totally unimportant and indeed not really real. It turns out to be easier than I would ever have thought it was, especially if authority figures are saying it, and the, some of the authority figures that are saying this now is teachers. And the result, after about 10 years of this in a lot of English schools, is that we have a lot of young adults who think it's really extremely bigoted to mention the fact that there are two sexes, and to mention the fact of somebody's sex if they don't want that sex mentioned. So that's the first thing that I would say about what's happening in schools in England and what's happened in the last 10 years is the, the curriculum, like what's really taught. And th this sort of goes into all different parts of the curriculum as well, like you're meant to weave it into history, weave it into mathematics, and always be basically kind of suggest selling the idea that sex is boring and basic and gender identity is modern and, you know, forward-looking and anti-bigoted. But the second thing is that a lot of schools are giving a lot of support to social transition. So a lot of schools feel it's their job now, and in fact they will, they've been told by lobby groups um, who've misquoted the law to them, that it's their duty under equality law and under anti-discrimination law to accept any declaration that a child makes at any age of which sex they really are and to immediately affirm this. So they will change names, they will change uh, gen what they call gender markers, like the sex that's recorded in the school roles, and they will tell all the other children, you know, such and such is a boy now, and they will um, make it a rule that anything else. That if you do, that will count as the equivalent of homophobic slurs or racist chants. Um, my, my own son, who's 16, when he registered with his sixth form college because he moved school at 16, um, he had no choice but to answer a question on his pronouns. He had to put in whether he used he, she, or they. And the school knows what sex he is. And the third part of the support um, for gender ideology in schools is in facilities, the way the school is organised. So a lot of schools in the UK now have gender neutral toilets and facilities, even though that's illegal, if that's your only option. Um, it's, and, and so on, they say that you play whichever sports you prefer, you, um, you, know, you can use whichever changing room you prefer, you can wear whichever uniform you prefer. 
And all of this is just teaching children that sex isn't real and doesn't matter, and it makes social transition easier. It takes a lot of courage for a child to stand out against these things. Hardly any ch child or teenager is actually brave enough to do that because the real punishment is social ostracism. People care about that more than they care about really nearly anything else. And so I know that when I talked in Keyes College um, just under three weeks ago, I heard from quite a lot of students that they didn't dare to come. And some of them came hours early and hid in a room next to the lecture theatre by, by prior arrangement with the guy who organised the event. And I went early and talked to them, and they said that none of their friends had any idea what they believed, and what they believe is that there are two sexes. They know that they would have no friends if they said this. I also heard from staff members who'd wanted to be there. There was one staff member said that she couldn't be there because her job was student-facing, and that if she went, this would get back to the students, and then they would refuse to work with her. Well, the end result of all of this is that schools are feeding and fueling two intimately linked social contagions, and one is the idea, or the meme, that sex isn't real and gender identity is, and the second is the experience of distress or dissociation from your own sex. And that's happening in lessons, in school organisation, and in school rules. And it's to do with everyone, and it's to do with the kids. So it's to do with everyone that you think that this is what makes your sex, but it's to do with the kids they've succeeded in disturbing about their own bodies and their own sex. And I think this has been happening for about a decade, and as I said at the beginning, it's no longer hitting just the vulnerable kids. So the early adopters were the ones who were on the autistic spectrum, who were you know, destined to grow up gay, who've got problems at home, who are very lonely, the ones who have eating disorders, um, you know, the ones who are anxious or depressed. The figures from the Tavistock say that the comorbidities of the kids they see, very numerous. But now it's just the most ordinary kids. It's kids who are from happy homes, doing well at school, lots of friends. They just think when they're 13 or so that Actually, they weren't meant to be a boy, they were meant to be a girl, or vice versa, much more often vice versa. And so it's mostly girls, and there's a lot of speculation about why it's mostly girls. And one possibility is that girls are generally more anxious and fearful than boys are, mm -hmm. and more attuned to other people, so more prone to social contagion. But it's also definitional. I didn't realise this until very recently, but now the definition of being trans has been broadened by the clinics to say anybody who's gender non-conforming. And if you look at the rules for gender, girls are much, much more gender non-conforming than boys are. And that's a function of the rules. The rules for girls are, you know, if you say what girl gender is, it's high heels, you know, makeup, it's a bunch of stuff that most girls can't stand doing all the time. Whereas a lot of boys don't actually find boyhood such a prison. So just as a statistical artefact, many, many more girls are gender non-conforming. And if those girls look online, they find that they're actually trans, according to the definition. I'll tell you two stories that I've heard since September, when kids went back to school this year, um, both of them via Sex Matters, where I work now. Um, one, they're both from state schools. So one is a girl of 13, and um, her parents got a letter home. It's not funny, it's really not funny, but it's also kind of funny because it's so, so mad. Um, the parents got an email home at the end of the first week of term that went, you know, Dear Mr and Mrs Smith, this is just to let you know that Louise is now Ben. And we are changing Louise's pronouns to Ben, uh, to he, him, and uh, hope you have a nice weekend. <laughs> and so they've managed to engage with the school and they've engaged with the child, and I'll tell you a little bit more about her. But um, another one that's really not funny at all, the child's 15 and she does have an autism diagnosis and she's had some family tragedy in the past few years. And she has been demanding to be accepted and supported in transition. She wants puberty blockers, she wants to take hormones when she's 16 and the parents have refused. And so she self-harmed to um, get referred to social services where she told them that her parents were transphobes and that was why she wanted to kill herself. And now that family are under a serious investigation where they've been told their two kids may be taken away. So this is your future if you don't sort this out, people. What can you do if this is you? Or what can you do if you're worried about what your children are learning? Because we're going to be hearing a bit more from our next speaker about the plans for RSE in Ireland. I'd start softly, softly. I'd, I'd just go and talk to a classroom teacher or a head of year and just say, I'm a bit worried. I've, you know, I've seen some stuff and just I'm a bit worried that maybe inaccurate or regressive stereotypes are being taught to children. Because of course, this is all very regressive. 
we all know this, like saying that girls are, you know, an outfit is an incredibly regressive thing to do. That you don't think it's right that other children are being dragooned into this. You don't think it's right that a child can't say what they see in front of them. And most importantly, that you are worried about safeguarding. Schools should take safeguarding concerns very seriously. You're worried about children being concealed about the, uh, having their sexes concealed when dealing with other children, that you're worried about any sort of rule that allows a boy into the girls' changing rooms or a girl into the boys' changing rooms where she will be at risk. Hopefully you'll get somewhere with that. It helps if you're in a coalition with other parents, and it helps if those parents are varied in their characteristics. So get some men on board. Dads care too. Try not to be everybody religious or everybody atheist. And if you've got a mixed race group, that's very, very helpful too, because then it's harder to write you off as just a bunch of boring, white, middle-aged women who are, of course, the world's most bigoted people. <laughs> and um, I think uh, what I realized since September is that it's very important to get parents involved whose own children aren't in crisis. Because if a person's own children are in crisis, they can't do anything because they're afraid of disturbing a very, very delicate situation they're afraid of their child getting angry with them. So reach out and talk to other parents. Find allies whose, parents are whose children are completely fine and then get them worried about what their children are being taught because this harms all children. It's bad for all children to learn sexist nonsense. Talk to your kids. If you get in there early, maybe you can inoculate them against this sort of thing. And I'm going to finish by telling you a story that's um, what, how one of those two families, the ones with the 13-year-old girl, how they managed it. So when they got this letter, they talked to their daughter and discovered she was binding her breasts. And they were horrified because that's very dangerous. It's a real risk. And so they said to her, you know, we've always cared a lot about your health and your well-being. We're worried this isn't healthy. And she said, but the lobby groups all say it's the best thing to do. And so they marshaled their facts and they talked to her and they horrified her. And I don't mean they scared her. I mean, they horrified her that she'd been lied to. So that sort of put a chink into the into the carapace that she'd built, she started to think, well, if they'd lied to me about that, maybe they'd lied to me about other things too. And she said, immediately, she said she'd stop wearing the binder, and the deal was that they would go and get a nice sports bra that would fit her comfortably and make her feel that she wasn't, you know, bouncing around the place or whatever. And then they just kept talking. And after a while, she said, I don't think I necessarily want to do, do this. And they'd gone back to the school together, and I haven't heard the last bit of the story. But I think that business of showing the child that you're on their side, really on their side, and that maybe other people aren't quite on their side as much as they thought they were, and telling the child and listening to the child, really listening, what they're saying, what are they trying to tell you when they say, I think I'm really a boy. I'm not saying it's easy because the whole world is against you, but most importantly what I want to say is sort this out. We're going to have a miserable unpicking thing because that school, they let slip to that parent that a tenth of the children on roll are not registered as their sex. And that's an ordinary state school. And most of them are girls, I'm guaranteeing it, so nearly 20% of the girls in that school are on roll, formally on roll with the school as not being girls. And there'll be more of them who are thinking about it. So that's where a social contagion can lead you if you just let it burn and if you get schools to teach it. Thank you.